so yep, avoiding legal snags, letting everybody know that you are being recorded. <laughs> yes. The fact that we should that's one of the topics we'll talk about. Yes, we will. <laughs> Privacy. So, so uh we've got a few things to talk about today. Uh we're going to review a few of the things we went over in our, our internal committee meeting yesterday. Um, we've got a few topics that are sort of uh, fresh, just to let you know what direction we're headed here from a project management standpoint, and then we should have plenty of time towards the end uh, to open the floor up to you guys to talk about whatever you like, whatever's been on your mind. Um, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and start uh, with all the issues. We, we left everything marked as committee review yesterday. Um, just as a reminder, the community does meet every Wednesday evening Pacific time. So if things are marked committee review or review committee, then don't expect that there's a response until after the next Wednesday. Right. So we, this is, you know, just for those of you who haven't joined us before, we've got this label review committee. Uh, that gets slapped basically on anything that requires uh, some sort of design guidance or a question about whether or not we need an RFC for this thing. Um, typically for the smaller stuff, we, we do not require an RFC, uh, but occasionally we'll say this is a complicated enough area that it requires. Hey, Heyman is joining us there. Um, so this was, um, this particular issue was basically around uh, the core CLR version, or the, excuse me, the CLR version property um, in PS version table. And I've got a slightly old version here on my machine. Uh, but if you'll see, I know, it's, it's disgraceful. Um, so, actually, I might have this alpha at 18. Nope. Okay. So, um, show how to install it quickly. I have, yeah. <laughs> uh, I have, like, all my other machines have it on there. Um, <laughs> so you'll see in PS version table, we've got the CLR version, and it's blank. Um, the problem here is that uh, this is basically a useless value. So Core CLR has hard-coded this to 4.0. Uh, .30319.42000. That's an old version of the full CLR, uh, CLR version. We should probably qualify what useless um, means here. It's because people start taking dependency on this when, when they should not have. And so now the CLR team ha has been forced to hard code it for compatibility. Right. So we may potentially hard code it for the same compatibility reasons. We're going to talk to the .NET team to find out uh, sort of what some of those are and why those occurred. You'll notice too, you know, I have I have .NET Framework 4.6.2 or 3 on this machine. Um, this CLR version is not the framework version. It's the version of the runtime itself, and that's why uh, in a core CLR world, uh, you know, there's there's two big differences. One is that we've got um, We've got our own uh, CLR that we that we bring with us, um, so we essentially, uh, you know, control the version of the CLR rather than you, the user, controlling the version of the CLR on the machine. Um, so a version of the CLR should map to a version of PowerShell, uh, and then there's also the, the matter of, um, you know, there's there's not a single uh, CLR version. There's really all these DLL runtimes, and so we're we're pursuing the possibility of, of populating that value with. Uh, one of these DLL versions, but again, we want to go talk to .NET to get some more guidance on on this issue. And uh, yep, if anybody has any strong opinions about that, uh, feel free to voice them in the chat. Hopefully, uh, Steve, I'm watching you the can, chat, so keep an eye on the chat. Cool. Um, so yeah, this is uh, generally we're leaving this as review committee because we do want to make sure to follow up here uh, with our our compatriots on the .NET team and, and get that thing. I think we had a pull request here that was, or was it just to be from Skype? Does it get the video? Should get the video. You should get the video, yeah. Did you mean something else last time? Yes. So this is another one that we talked about uh, in our last community call. Um, this is a rather large uh, pull request. You'll see here this has got 11,000 lines of code added. Uh, and the reason that is, um, we, we essentially want to lay the quote-unquote groundwork for portable or universal modules. Uh, the idea here is that we want to expose a set of reference assemblies or facade assemblies um, in a very similar way to how .NET Standard works. Um, we, we essentially want to say, hey, if you include these reference assemblies uh, in your, your application or in your uh, C-sharp commandlets, um, you'll be able to 
those commandlets will compile to work with both full CLR PowerShell and core CLR PowerShell. Um, so we want to expose a sort of universal API, so to speak, um, that uh, works across, you know, basically from PowerShell 3 up to PowerShell 6. Yes. Um, we're intentionally minimizing this API surface area. So you'll see here, uh, I don't know if Jason's been committing this every time. No, I don't um, think he has. Okay, so uh, unfortunately we, we haven't committed our last pass of the uh, of this document, but we there's, there's two things we're trying to cut out. We're trying to cut out anything uh, that does not currently work with PowerShell 6. Oh, is it your wake up? So I'm. I guess that wasn't me. I hope that whoever that was seems to have figured it out. <laughs> yeah, there was. Well, there was music playing, so we muted ourselves for a second. That was interesting. Okay. <laughs> Let's share this back. Oh, I thought it might have been a tab auto playing or something, but okay. Yeah, maybe somebody put us on hold. That would make sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so we're back in it. So again, this is you know this is a giant uh, a giant pull request. Um, I'm not going to hit view here because it's going to to basically crash my browser. Um, but but like I said, there's there's two buckets of stuff. There's stuff that we we want to cut out that we absolutely do not plan to support in PowerShell six, and we want to cut stuff out that uh, we're not sure will be fully capable or fully working in in six, and that we want to deprecate over time. So there's things like uh, snap-ins, workflows, uh, those are not likely going to come back with PowerShell Core, uh, and so we don't want that to be part of this sort of universal. <coughs> um, there's also stuff that uh, we're not sure will be fully working in PowerShell 6. So, for instance, uh, there's a lot of stuff around uh, SIM instances and SIM sessions. Um, this isn't totally planned work for... Uh, okay, hold on. I'm getting some people saying they can't hear, but some people saying they can. So, I think it's localized. I yeah, we should be should be. No, some people here. saying yes. I think we're okay. Okay, um, but but it's not that we absolutely don't plan to bring Sim back. But again, we want a universal API surface area for everyone to be able to uh, to target in the 6.0 timeframe. And so we may follow a very similar approach to .NET Standard here, in which we sort of expand uh, this API over time. Um, so it'll be definitely be forward compatible, and any new ones will be super strict supersets. Exactly. And cross-platform, cross-CLR, cross-PowerShell. Exactly. And one other thing is basically we, we are starting with a smaller set, and if that doesn't work for you. So whenever we have to take a decision, we are editing on the side of if it doesn't make sense, let's remove it. If there's a need, we can always add it later. Right. So it's it's an additive model going forward rather than a subtractive. Yeah. So we'll you know we'll we'll eventually have something that looks like .NET Standard 2.0 that's got all the old stuff. I'm sure that, that you are all used to as we continue porting old features back in. And one of the question which Steve is responding to is. Uh, whether it affects modules written in scripts versus C sharp. So it's purely from a C sharp perspective. They so take dependence and reference assemblies. Yeah, and, and for the, the PowerShell side of things, uh, I think we still want to eventually uh, codify some, some script analyzer rules and 
you know, we, we got to write a lot of documentation around what exists and what does not exist in PowerShell 6. So that's that's just sort of a, an exercise that uh, we, we still have to go through. There's a couple of questions on this topic. So one is, um, any thoughts on how this gets into the old, uh, old meaning Windows PowerShell releases, presumably? Uh, I'm not sure what that means. So the, pr the plan is that once we define the standard, we'll release this on NuGet, so anyone building new modules should take this dependency. It'll work against Windows PowerShell and PowerShell Core. Uh, how are you? How are you going to make it work against Windows PowerShell? Because my understanding is you have to ship shim assemblies to PowerShell oh. five, not That's correct to so PowerShell we, six. You will have a package, and I think we've thought. I don't think we we don't have anything concrete yet, but maybe one of the thoughts is we'd have something on like gallery and other modules take dependencies on it. Yeah, I think that's that's the current current thinking that we want to experiment with is is yeah, that you essentially declare a dependency in your module manifest on the gallery for this compat module that contains those shim. Um, and then uh, that'll that'll take care of that. Uh, but again, a lot of this is going to be um, you know, we, we got to do some experimentation. This is all, all somewhat theoretical. Jason has done a lot of this with .NET Standard 1.6 already and, and has validated that PS Readline can be built universally across all these things. Um, but obviously, it's a it's a less complex scenario, and we want to, you know, I, I know you have a few issues, Joel, um, around the, uh, the sort of NuGet experience, and we just had a conversation with the .NET team uh, about that yesterday. Um, so... We're definitely um, yeah required assemblies. I believe it's this guy. Yeah, this is. I mean, this right here is a very real problem, which is like you know how do we, how do you as a module author ship uh, you know the the dependencies that are either platform specific or CLR specific and not not essentially ship thirteen copies of the same library in every module. Um, so this is it's still something we're working through and and. Um, you know, trying to come up with an answer that doesn't doesn't like replicate the GAC, essentially, because um, that's something that the core CLR team has has said is probably not a very good idea. Um, so, uh, Trevor, the next the next question here was, will the guidance be to target on a standard two going forward? Yes. Um, we right now are are due to some reasons around reflection and add type and all this stuff. We are a net core app two uh, a system dot management dot automation, which um, we're talking and working through some of the challenges around what that means for people who want to host PowerShell in their .NET Core applications. But from a hey, what do you build commandlets with? Yes, if you target net standard two o. Uh, that is going to be the most highly compatible way to, to build commandlets across CLR versions. Um, did you have anything to add there? No. Um, and, and we should note, uh, we've said this before, one of the, the awesome things about uh, .NET Standard 2.0 is that it's uh, IL compatible with um, existing .NET Framework libraries. So as long as a library um, that was built against .NET Framework 4.5 or 4.6 uh, only uses the surface area exposed by .NET Standard 2.0. Um, it will actually load in a Core 2.0 world without recompilation. Um, and so we, we're expecting that um, a lot of these modules, especially the ones that ship their own, all their dependencies local to the module, um, may actually just load into into PowerShell 6. Uh, you should, is what we've been told. So actually, for any um, one on the call who is a module author, the nightly builds are already building against uh, .NET, standard, uh, .NET app standard 2.0. <laughs> um, so you should be able to test it out today. Um, not the latest, not the Alpha 18, but the Beta 1 will be. But if you get the nightly builds, those should all be built against .NET Standard 2.0, basically. Yeah, so we had a, a this this was our, our glorious uh, pull request that got merged three days ago. Um, thanks to Dongbo for, for all of his hard work here. This, uh, yeah, our, our next alpha, or or I guess it's probably going to be a beta one. Here. Yeah, next one gets beta. released will be a, uh, a .NET Core 2.0 based uh, application. Um, I, I'm going to let Trevor hop on here. He said he had a question to ask over voice. Trevor? Thanks. Um, so the question is, uh, I, I've been trying to, uh, I tried once to load a, a .NET Core assembly that we had built in C Sharp 
uh, into a PowerShell core on Mac using the assembly load context, and it basically silently failed. Um, there was no output, and uh, our, our, we were unable to access the types inside of that assembly. So, have you, do you guys have any like any tests around that specific scenario, like loading from PowerShell directly? Yeah. So, unfortunately, the uh, the assembly load context stuff is a a little bit over my head, uh, and b very very complicated and in flux. Um, uh, we're it's sort of the, the the bit of code that we have to twiddle with um, to try and figure out you know I, I mentioned just a minute ago having your own binaries app local to your module um, makes things a lot easier uh, we're trying to figure out how we might query the GAC or query uh, windows or you know do some kind of intelligent probing in our assembly load context for other dependencies um, the assembly load context, for those of you that don't know, is essentially uh, the the way and the location in which we like load and look for uh, assemblies to load into our runtime. So, if I was understanding your scenario correctly, Trevor, you're you're essentially you have your own .NET Core app, and you're trying to use our assembly load context in order to load DLLs into a PowerShell run space. Yeah, so we developed uh, just a simple library, and we wanted to load that in using PowerShell. Um, so we tried to hit the default assembly load context. Um, I don't remember the exact syntax. It's very similar to app domain, where you reference the app domain class, and then there's a default app domain. Uh, very similarly, there's the assembly load context class, and then there's a default assembly load context in the in process. And uh, we tried to use the whatever the, the load method or load file method. Uh, and, and reference the path to the DLL, and it silently failed. There was no output, uh, but we couldn't access the types in defined in the library. Yeah, I think this is the difficulty in that you know we're uh, with we have our own assembly load context, and and it sounds like you're going through. I don't know if it's the default one for our app or the yeah. default one for NetCore, but um, it's it's really finicky and really touchy, and and it's something that we need much stronger guidance on because right now there's about two people within the team that fully understand that. Uh, that specific issue, please please file an issue. Uh, we'll make sure that that uh, whatever you're trying to do gets corrected in our documentation and that we're, we're you know making sure your scenario is in mind. But it's it sounds like a pretty generic scenario that we just need to document better. Yeah, well, it's good to know that you, at least you mentioned that, that you guys are creating a separate assembly load context. So maybe Maybe it was failing because I was trying to load it into the default context for yeah, the .NET I framework. That, I think that's what's going on. Um, but again, I am the first to admit that this is all uh, a little bit over my head. Um, so um, I want to move on to the RFC repository, unless anybody has any other questions around the .NET standard stuff. Uh, finally, an issue. Perfect. Actually, I have one more follow-up. Yep. Um, so David Wilson hosted a really good discussion at the PowerShell Summit just recently about um, basically resolving uh, dependency chains for libraries that are installed from NuGet and uh, you know loading those in the proper order from the script modules and you know having some method of defining those dependencies inside of a, a manifest so that you don't have to include binary artifacts with a script module um, is that kind of related to this at all, or is that something separate? Um, you know, I am not familiar uh, with what you're talking about, but it sounds very similar uh, to to something that we need to solve that that, uh, that, that Joel filed, that, that issue I brought up that Joel filed before. Um, but I, I imagine that David's probably giving guidance on how to do that today, um, and we likely need to expose a, a simpler way uh, to do that, whether it's in your module manifest or, uh, you know, we, we've, we've talked about having sort of like a like a local GAC to PowerShell, so to speak, like some sort of NuGet folder that keeps all of your common dependencies, but, uh, you know, it's kind of a dangerous territory to embark on because, you know, you have to make all these shared libraries that do, that should or shouldn't get upgraded with different modules, and, you know, you're, you're sort of back in the same place that, uh, it's, not, 
Yeah. Joey, this is the this is basically what I had said is my only way to solve this right now is to take every library that I want off NuGet and publish it as a module on PowerShell. Because the right. only reason there's a problem is that I can't have my module package depend on a NuGet package. Right. Because it's in a different repository. Right. And and currently that means I have to sh reship it. And yeah. Essentially, it would be awesome if PowerShell said, you know, we are actually a development platform and we need to figure out how to load NuGet libraries from the NuGet cache that's on the box because yeah. NuGet caches them all and the end. But it's, yeah, anyway. Got it. Yeah, this is, um, were you, you're asking if he, he had filed an issue? Yeah. Yeah, so it's it was filed by, by Joel and, um, it's the put in Nixman here. It's yeah, this XPlot required assemblies must automatically right. consider lib framework. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean I this is definitely in the front of my mind and I, I think you're absolutely right, Joel. We're just we're trying to figure out a way to do this that makes sense to full CLR as well, which is obviously the tricky um, so we want we want to figure out what the right design is from a six standpoint, um, whether it's from lib framework or from you know, some local directory or something like that, but uh, we'll definitely be tackling this in the, in the near future. Um, did you mark that for whatever that mouse We should mark that for... <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I've got did these for it? both of these because they're important, okay. but uh, we did rename it, yes. We'll talk about that after yeah. this. So we're going to do this last RFC one, and then we can jump okay. in on the milestone stuff. Um, so uh, this is actually, and I apologize, um, you know, our last community call was, was a little scarce because we had forgotten to hell a blog on it. Um, but we, we did have a, a couple people join us uh, and give us some very good feedback around um, the process for filing an RFC. Um, and specifically, there was some confusion around the documentation uh, for uh, writing an RFC, how to submit it, uh, etc. Uh, so I went into a pass of our existing RFC process. One of the one of the big things was to change um, to a, a a workflow that uses pull requests instead of issues for comments. Um, I think that you know, especially with uh, with GitHub reviews now, uh, this provides a really easy way for each of the committee members to um, give feedback and then approve or reject an RFC uh, with that feedback. Uh, and then also it allows all of our community members to give line-by-line -line feedback in the pull request. Um, so basically, we I think we all decided yesterday that we're good with accepting this. That was I think so. Yeah. yeah. We just wanted to talk to you about this call. Yeah, yeah. We just wanted to make sure uh, to give you guys a heads up that this is where we're going. So um, you know you can still file issues around uh, the RFC process itself, or if you have questions on, a, on an RFC or something that, that sort of goes, you know, somebody asked if, oh, if this, you know, if an RFC is appropriate here. Um, that's perfectly fine to file issues in this repo, um, but we're gonna start to move away from this, um, this RFC, you know, dash with the monolithic, uh, you know, sort of feedback all in one, one issue. Um, and so uh, you, can, you can just provide feedback here. And thank you, Stephen Murawski, for that, that feedback before and for, uh, you know, been engaged with me here with the back and forth, so uh, it's really helpful. So I think we're just going to go ahead and merge this thing. This reviewed. Does anyone have any questions around that? We not. Oh, we don't. <laughs> we don't have a reviewed in label in this repo. It's just, yeah. You can have that later. Uh, sounds great. Yay for review and PRs. Cool. Thanks, guys. So we wanted to talk about some quick project management stuff. Uh, we had discussed this last time that we're slowly moving over to leverage these sort of GitHub projects. Um, these are great because they give us a way to prioritize work outside of the milestone uh, axis. So for, for instance, developer experience, um, you know, this guy has a couple high priority uh, uh, issues here. One of these is completed, so we've started to, you know, take those, move them over to completed, great. Um, and then you'll see over here, I get this way to triage, you know, sort of stuff like this cross plat, um, and and make that high priority. So uh, I think this is slightly higher at the moment as this. 
Um, but yeah, this is just a better way for us to track sort of by category um, the, the stuff that's going on. Uh, so for, for beta 1, we had uh, planned to tackle uh, a bunch of issues around .NET Standard 2.0. We wanted to make sure to get on .NET Core 2.0, which we've just accomplished. Um, we want to uh, get sort of all these REST scenarios working really well, so we tackled a lot of issues around uh, convert from JSON, uh, invoke REST method, etc., cetera, uh, and, and fixed a ton of those. The JSON support is significantly better in 6.0 uh, than it was in 5.1. Um, and then we're also, we're, we're trying to still sneak this guy in, um, but we want to have some telemetry. And this, of course, is the, uh, you know, the hot topic. Um, <clears throat> right now, we're using application insights uh, in our initial prototype for telemetry. Um, and uh, the only thing that we are transmitting uh, through application insights, which you'll be able to see very plainly in our code, uh, is the git commit ID of the instance. Uh, and the, I want to say the OS description. It would be the OS description. Yes, yeah. that's actually in. Um, the and other. so uh, an OS description the is, is essentially the output of uname dash A. Um, and so it looks like, looks like this here. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's nothing about your machine uh, that we're outputting here. Um, you know, we're the the IP addresses even get anonymized by by App Insights, um, and then we're we're going to sort of have this um, this easy method up front uh, where we want to uh, we're basically just going to drop a file down in the the PS Home directory that says delete me if you want to disable telemetry. Um, we had discussed the the possibility of doing an environment variable like .NET Core. Um, the problem with that is that environment variables, modifying them in installers is kind of tricky because we want to also offer the ability to disable telemetry in an MSI uh, and, you know, possibly in the other package managers as they allow them. Um, and, and we want this to be as discoverable as possible. We don't want anyone to have to go Google, uh, you or know, Bing. Uh, or Bing. <laughs> uh, you know, what environment variable they need to set and whether it's a user environment variable or a machine environment variable and all these sorts of things. So we're going to play with this as sort of the, the way to do this for, for now. For beta um, one. For beta one. And anybody that's, uh, you know, got any problems with that or, or has uh, wants to start that discussion, feel free to open an issue. Um, I just want to clarify, like, the, the file solution is just a short-term, um, easy way to opt out for beta 1, and we, I think we want to move towards the startup config RFC that uh, Jim Schreer authored as kind of like the way to do it um, as the final, a future beta. Yeah, so there's a, there's an RFC we have here around the, uh, startup. the startup config. Um, so this is, this is one we want to get closed on for beta 2, um, and it basically allows at, at uh, before the PowerShell engine is started for us to to set some keys to configure PowerShell ahead of time. So um, this is ultimately where we want to go. But for now, you know, we, we wanted this to be discoverable. We didn't have any documentation around it. And so, you know, a file called delete me to disable telemetry is, is very, very straightforward and, and hopefully discoverable to anybody that's uh, their, their uh, PS home directory. Um, and we'll probably, I think, enable disable telemetry commandlets as well, just to delete or re-add that file if uh, yeah, anyone problems. is still aligned. Um, does this sound okay? Does anybody have any questions about telemetry? I mean, this is, uh, I mean, so you guys understand, like, we don't do this because it's useless or, or you know, or just to invade <laughs> privacy. Like, this is something that, uh, unfortunately, download counts are, are a completely useless metric to us. And we, we need to understand, you know, how important PowerShell is to people uh, on which platforms, you know, is, is PowerShell on Linux more or less important than PowerShell on Mac? Uh, are people experimenting with this on Windows? It's, we're essentially operating in the dark right now, other than, uh, you know, all you great people joining us on the call. And, and this. And I'll, I'll just clarify, it's not completely useless, the download number, but it doesn't provide the insight we are looking for. <clears throat> and there are ways people can download one time and use it 100 times or download 100 times and only use it once. So the idea is to, apart from the downloads, figure out the usage rather than just the download. Right. <clears throat> and also the plan is to make all the reports that we get from the telemetry public, so we part of the dashboard that is 
already out there. Yeah, so for those of you that don't know, we have uh, Steve Steve published a blog a month or two ago. I don't know. Well, that... um, about this GitHub dashboard that we that we built, uh, and basically we're gonna plumb this this data into that. Uh, and again, it'll it'll show you know this is fully anonymized. We're not we're not hiding anything here. It's it's all just. Uh, it's all going to be just available right here, and this is actually our project management status as well. So you'll see we're drilling down, you know, issues for beta one release, um, you know, our top contributors and and uh, so on and so forth. Um, so this is really interesting. If you ever check this out, this was ignore a that blip. The script ran twice. I deleted it from Azure Storage Table, but um, I don't know when Power BI ever cleans it up. But yeah, I thought it would, but anyways, just ignore that blip. But needless to say, we want to have some data around, you know, how many. How many instances of PowerShell are out there in the wild, and that's that's really just uh, useful for us to gauge uh, sort of popularity and that sort of thing. Um, and and there was a question on the call: if we ever decide to add more information to the telemetry, would that go through the RFC process? The answer is unilaterally yes. Um, you know, we've we've got we consider privacy extremely important, and this is something that. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to do everything transparently out in the open, and you know, you, you shouldn't see us just arbitrarily adding new keys into the telemetry. Everything that we add here is going to be very intentional, mindful, and, and for a specific reason. So, um, open source, so you'll see it anyway. <laughs> you will see it anyway, but we, we will not sneak these in in any way. And, like we'll, and are... we'll also make sure we're encouraging that no one else is sneaking stuff in. Yes, yes. And, and everybody knows on the team that this is an important thing and that we can't just add telemetry willy nilly. So. Awesome. Uh, so with that, uh, sort of go back to this project management stuff. Um, so those were our goals, telemetry down in Core 2.0 and uh, the rest JSON improvements um, for Beta 1. And so you'll see we're, we're drilling down these issues for Beta 1. Uh, doo -doo -doo. And we had plans to release Beta 1 around the... Uh, well, May, a week the, before well, so May 3rd. The build time frame, yeah. So the... the the first week of May, you'll see we're getting we're getting real close up on that. There's there's a chance, of course, with 21 open issues that a few of these will not make it. Um, but you know we're we're working. Most of these are on track. We did review these yesterday. Um, after this, uh, we want to stay on the same release cadence, release train that we were on uh, with the alphas. And so that means a uh, new release every three weeks. Um, and we're just going to continue revving up the numbers of the betas here. So two, three, four. Uh, we had had a milestone called Beta 2 for a very long time, uh, and we hadn't really thought through keeping this release cycle. Um, we didn't want to do like Beta 1.1 1 .1 or anything silly like that. Uh, so we're just going forward on the Beta 1 to 2, 3, 4, 5 train, uh, and then we've, we've renamed the Beta 2 milestone to just Beta, which basically means these are all the things that we need to accomplish before we can exit Beta. Um, so we've got 93 open issues here. The next sort of set of priorities uh, for the following betas are around uh, remoting. So we've got, uh, let me pop back into the projects. Um, we've got a project on remoting over SSH, remoting over WSMAN. Um, both of these things we think are critical to PowerShell interoperability, people on new machines or new platforms managing old machines and old platforms, vice versa. Um, we want to tackle Linux and Mac usability. so. We've already started to sort of, you know, change some of the platform defaults. Things like aliases are different uh, on different platforms, but we need a way for uh, for people to switch into all of the platform defaults of another platform so that they can write scripts in an agnostic way. And then, you know, we need to tackle some of the things like file encodings have been very popular uh, in issues for the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, something that we need to solve because uh, the ecosystem is very different across platforms. Uh, and then our developer story. So. You know, we want to solve all these NuGet issues, make sure that PowerShell uh, standard, quote unquote, uh, is, is a, a good API set, and that all this .NET Core 2.0 stuff is working as we intended it to, get all the assembly load contact stuff squared away, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so those are really the focuses. Now here's the thing, any of this can change as you guys tell us differently, right? I mean, based on just based on usage, uh, we may find out um, that, you know, People aren't, uh, you know, dropping this thing on their Mac or whatever, and that, and that this is a, a, you know, not shouldn't be a priority for us to enable you know, remoting from a Mac or something like that. That's just a random example, but the point is, 
this is a very living roadmap. You know, we we will change this according to your feedback. If new issues come in that are clearly high priority, uh, those will you know change our priorities and and uh, and so on and so forth. So this is just sort of our current thinking. Please let us know how you're using PowerShell six. Uh, you know, when when you have scenarios that break file issues, tell us what your scenarios are so we understand how it's getting used out in the wild, that sort of thing. Uh, and we really appreciate it. Um, so with that, uh, I think I'm going to open the floor up for just generic questions. We've got some, some interesting issues here. Uh, is anyone uh, blocked on like a personal deployment? Uh, maybe a pull request that you've submitted that that's you you don't understand how to proceed. Uh, maybe an issue that that has been neglected that you filed in the repo. Any of those sorts of things. Uh, this is a great time to raise them. And um, while you think about it, another question is from a timing perspective: um, Is this a okay time for the community call? Uh, the number of participants we see is about similar in 30 ranges, sometimes 50. So um, just wanted to make sure we are not missing a set of people who want to attend, but the time is blocking them. Yeah, we know Steve. <laughs> you haven't missed one yet, Steve. Perfect attendance award. And, and as you talk with other people in community or in your uh, work group and stuff, uh, what, what kind of feedback you are hearing about PowerShell Core. I know people have been using Windows PowerShell for a long time. So one, Keep going. Uh, once you um, talk about PowerShell Core, what kind of response do you see from them? That'll be good to know as well. I just saw somebody call out issue 3232, Kelsey. Um, Yes, this one is, so it's currently set to low priority, but you'll notice that it's in the, the beta milestone because this is something we do kind of got to figure out. Um, it's really hard to solve. Uh, so just a quick summary. This is basically, I'm already sitting inside a PowerShell on a Linux machine. Um, and for instance, you know, I've got uh, foo.txt is owned by root, right? And I want to say uh, sudo remove item foo.txt. Um, this is really difficult because PowerShell is operating in a process. Uh, the runtime's been spun up with very specific privileges, and escalating out of that um, is is very tricky. I think right now somebody proposed a hack that's like, um, yeah, like essentially you'd have to invoke elevate it. Uh, yeah, but I think there's like, like you could you could run sudo bash running are, PowerShell. No, there's e, there's there's a clinical easy ways to do it, but it's not very PowerShell y. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Dan Trasen, who's assigned to this, is on the team and he's he's actively investigating, looking at different proposals for the implementation. Um, yeah. I think yeah, we, we definitely we need it. Like there's no way I can't and of course, we we want the same uh, capability or component capability on Windows as well. So, yeah. So there's a question about uh, PowerShell DSC support plan. Um, at this point, we don't have anything to say more than what is available there in terms of you can uh, uh, compile a DSC configuration on Linux, but uh, what it boils down to. Uh, having the DSC engine uh, and the rest of the stuff work with PowerShell code. That's something we're looking at, but I don't know if anything uh, we have to share publicly. What's the DSC? So, yeah, so for those of you that don't know, there is this um, this repository here, which is the, the native local configuration manager for, for Linux. This has existed for quite some time, but uh, the thing that it does not uh, support is DSC resources written in PowerShell. Um, so these currently have to be written as like oh my providers either in native code or in Python, uh, which is a blocker for a lot of people we understand. Um, and so you know we're we're investigating various paths forward here, but we don't unfortunately have anything to share right now. Um, but as Heyman said, 
you can now compile the MOFs on a Linux machine. And so if you are using this thing, um, you know, you can write a, conf a DSC configuration in PowerShell and you don't have to, to build that on a, on a, a Windows box. Darwin has a comment about reception of PowerShell code on Linux. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah, totally. Okay. Okay. Um, one of the things I did uh, recently, well, we've got one guy on my team who's a Linux fanboy, so he's the opposite of what we used to experience with Windows 15 years ago. Like, he hates PowerShell just because it's PowerShell. But I asked him how many um, of the Linux pros he knows use Linux on the desktop. And he said he knows of one guy, and he, that's because he used to work for Red Hat. And so I think the the adoption I think the adoption of this from the Linux side from people who are Linux native Linux uh, folks uh, is going to uh, have a lot to do with how well it works on Mac because that's what they develop on even though the back end is all uh, real Linux so to speak. Absolutely, I I think your intuition's right there. I totally agree and have voiced many of the same things internally. I want to see the telemetry validate that assumption. Um, and that's one of the big reasons we're doing that. Um, but you're right, like, it's it's easier for us to test right now internally. We've got a lot of developers, including myself, uh, running Linux on the bare metal now so that we, you know, sort of live it and feel it. Um, it's a little trickier for us to get Dude. MacBooks sometimes, not because we have any kind of... Although, I'm, I'm sitting next to Bruce, who's on his brand spanking new touch personal, bar. It's a personal. Touch personal. bar MacBook, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We, we do have some some Mac some books, but yeah. we, we don't have Macs book for everybody, and uh, it's you cannot legally or in a right way uh, do a VM which is running Mac. You can do it right. very easily with Linux stuff, so that also helps people yeah. uh, cross the barrier and self. No also. Hackintoshes at Microsoft. No, no Hackintoshes. I, 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 part of me too is thinking about the Brew repository, getting full support for that as part of uh, the build process. So uh, I believe, like, this is actually something I didn't know that we had because it's not in the instructions. I no, need to we have out, it. We but... just, we just um, accidentally forgot to publish to Homebrew for the 18. I think that should have been resolved Yeah, now. there's Homebrew. No, but we didn't, we didn't, uh, this tells you how to install Homebrew's OpenSSL and, and to fix mm -hmm. the curl oh, problems, no, but we, we didn't, we didn't document that we, that we do Homebrew. We, uh, yeah. we, yeah, we do it. Maybe you're saying we don't do document that we, we don't do document do that oh, we okay. do, do it. Yes. Um, because we, I saw a pull request come in the other day that was like, fix homebrew, like, because we forgot to publish. And so uh, that's a great point that we just need to. And can we get, the other thing too would be getting VS Code. So I'm, I'm building a new Bash installer that I hope to uh, do a pull request on soon. And um, I'm putting the ability to do VS Code as an option switch. And so if VS Code could get over to homebrew as well, that would be really helpful because these people who are going to be the adopters who drive adoption, they want to, you know, whack the whole development environment on the machine in a couple seconds and start playing with it. Yeah. Can, uh, that is that absolutely uh, David Wilson's most plugged into the VS Code team. Um, They're not even on app yet, <laughs> which is annoying mm -hmm. for me. There's an update to download it. Are they? <laughs> well, they they onboarded. I thought packages. To, uh, to packages yeah. If they did, they need to update their own updater. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that pulls it from there. Um, Anyways, we should have the discussion with um, the VS yeah. Code. Yeah, when we... VS yeah, Code is on AppGet. Okay, so they just need to update their... their um, the GUI yeah, it's probably... Updater to leverage that if it's available. Oh, I don't see it there. Well, it's yeah, somewhere. I, mean, I know because I installed it from Yum. So yeah, it's, it's it's definitely there. But yeah, well, they should they should get on homebrew too. Um, uh, we can help them out and maybe give them some guidance on getting there. Um, like I said, it looks like we're there. We just forgot to document it. So I'm I'm making a note as well to to get it taken care of. Um, but I think you're right, Darwin. And and thank you by the way for all that work you're doing on on the Bash installer and. Uh, Darwin also owns the chocolatey package for our OpenSSH yeah, I remember uh, that. Uh, project, uh, so that's it's super duper helpful, especially for those folks on Nano. And that's um, uh, it's technically not a chocolatey package; it's a universal package. Docker, non-chocolatey. Right. Yep. 
Yep, and you, yeah, you were saying that the, uh, no, I, I need to get back to you on that, that issue about all the all the powerful stuff you're doing in your installation script, because we, uh, we may very well want to take that into mainline stuff. Um, anyone have anything else here? This is all awesome stuff. Yes, this is a link to that, uh, that installer right now. It's a homebrew cask for VS Code. There's an issue against VS Code for adding homebrew. Awesome. Well, I'll go over it. Do you have a link, Steve? I'll, I'll just go plus one it. Um, anybody else? We got about well, could I, could I hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to like I'd like to know the status of Globe. The RFC is rejected, and there's no more issues on it. On Globe. It's important. Yeah, Globe. I'm not familiar. G L O B Glob. If I'm oh, 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 globbing, 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 globbing. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Maybe um, Bruce can talk about globbing since he's working on this. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah. The original no issues. Rejected. Mm -hmm. This one is trying to assign to Bruce, I believe. I won't hear. I'll let Bruce talk to you in the room. Yeah, um, so I'm implementing globbing on native commands. Um, at least some amount of it should be in beta 1. <laughs> There's some known issues, but we'll postpone yeah. that to right. future betas. As for, long, yeah. for the time being, I think we're, we're going to, like, are you, are you enabling native globbing for Windows native binaries as well, or just for Linux at the moment? Uh, I'm just Im implementing it for Linux right now because Linux, yeah. Win Windows Windows binaries do their own globbing. Right. So the the, the non-controversial part of this uh, is that we need to enable it for native binaries for Linux. Mm -hmm. The question from there is, okay, do we try and unify the unify that the world. on Windows? <laughs> Uh, because a lot of Windows binaries do their own globbing, and some of it's in a slightly dissimilar way to how Linux generically globs. Um, you know, there's also uh, globbing of commandlets. Like right now, all globbing is handled individually in. Yeah, globbing is handled by commands. Yeah. So, so, so it's only a question of native commands. Like but it may be that we want to expose, like, like we had talked about, like an attribute or something for like. Like giving commandlets an easier way to to enable globbing, but we I do think have, that's not. We in do scope have an right but yeah, what's it glob against? Right, right, right. Get the process globs against the processes, not the file system. Right. So the shell in Linux only globs against the file system. It can't glob against any other data store. So all commandlets are responsible for their own implementing their own globbing. We have a library for doing it, like the Wildcat library. But uh, and and likewise on on Windows. The commands do their own globbing, so uh, and they do it in whatever funny way they might, like they might require a list to be comma separated, and if you glob, then it'll expand it to comma separated itself. But uh, uh, file system globbing won't do that. Yeah, I think we had, we'd even talked about like maybe having just a black list of like X's that we didn't want to. That's everything. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> And that's why the original RC was rejected. It's just it's more complicated. I think what Bruce is solving for beta one is just a simple file. Yeah. There's an error that everyone hits when they try to use PowerShell as their yeah. normal shell. Make PowerShell glob on uh -huh. Unix the way yeah. Unix can work the from secure string in Linux. Okay, we'll just close this up real quick. Yeah, this this is um uh, I mean one of the things we kinda wanted to fix in the Windows ecosystem was like like git.exe, for example, has to maintain like two separate code paths because they need to implement their own globbing on Windows. Uh, but they'll probably have to do that anyway, mm -hmm. because it's got to work with, so. work with CMD. So it's, it's, yeah, we may just sort of leave that alone and just fix the Linux side. But we, we know we need it, so thank you. Uh, convert to, convert from secure string. Uh, I don't have a timeline. Um, the, I think the, the foundation work is done. Yeah, so this is one of the big things that we were able to bring back with .NET Core 2.0 um, because they, they brought that secure string API back. Uh, the problem is that they still depends on still depends on this this protected data. 
uh, type, and this is not available in NetStandard 2.0. So we need to uh, sort of rework those commandlets uh, in order to do that. You'll see this is priority high. Uh, it's something we want to tackle in the beta time frame. Um, so it's definitely exit criteria for for shipping, uh, you know, a release candidate or an RTM build. Um, but we don't have a timeline right now. Um, the secure string type, though, uh, is a, is available in NetStandard 2.0. You think you can cast a string to it or something like that? Uh, possibly. I don't. I don't know how much testing we've done here. Like I said, we got onto NetCore 2.0 like four days ago. Um, so we're still investigating a bunch of the stuff that definitely had to wait for that. Um, but it's important. We know we need to do it. So it's not likely coming in for beta one. But it'll be a subsequent date after that. Yeah. Uh, okay. No problem. Does anyone else have anything for us? Okay, another question. What is blocking rest of DNS name from Porsche car? It's origin. Resolve DNS name? Do you have an issue number by any chance? Yep. Talking about the commandlet or the API? I mean the commanded. Oh, this guy, right. Okay. Um, so, this working on Windows? Uh, working on Windows PowerShell. So, I'm not familiar with this commandlet, but that's a client, a DNS client. Yeah, so. Um, well, as part of the .NET standard tool work, um, Part of, part of the effort we're doing now, but probably won't be realized in beta one, is validating the uh, inbox command that's work under partial core. Um, I suspect is this a CDX one for that? Yes. Yeah. So some of these you'll be surprised actually just work um, because they're CDXML. They only work on Windows. Oh, oh snap it. <laughs> All right, this oh, one's not going to work. <laughs> That's so... Uh, I'll need to talk to that solve team. Solve DNS, yeah, we're, we're going to have to talk to that team um, because they currently depend on snap-ins, which is one of the very few things that we absolutely are not bringing forward uh, to Power Core. for. So <laughs> that's what's blocking that. No, actually, um, if you load the DLL, just go there. And it, snap-in is just a wrapper. So just up your command. Okay. Yeah, just load the um, DNS CD. Oh, the MSFT? That'll import as a module? Yeah. I did not know that. What was for? So no, you know what it is. You learn something new every day, guys. Yes, so... get DNS client set. So that's not the right XML file, but... Uh, blah, blah. Can I do this? I do for each. For each, get oh my god. We explicitly don't blow up on. Uh, I should have done the. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Resolve DNS. What is it? Uh, oh. Get command DNS. Star. I don't think it's there. Yeah, it might be. In, in a different one. Fun. We have to look at PSD1 file. See, the DNS lookup dot I don't know if that's. Uh, can you? It's got to be in there. Type. Do a type DNS client dot PSD1. There might be some uh, X, uh, DLL that. Okay. Yeah. Is that So anyway, needless to say, as Steve said, we need to do. Command uh, to export resolve DNS name. It's coming from. <laughs> Uh, DLL uh, root mod. Yeah, nested modules DNS lookup. Coming out of DNS lookup, it's, uh, it's actually. Oh, you have to do uh, DNS lookup dot DLL. Yeah. We're not IL compatible. So just oh, yeah. binary block. Yeah. Crap. Mm -hmm. um, so this might work in 2.0, we don't know. But, uh, but needless to say, we've got a huge laundry list where we're currently analyzing. To what extent some of these inbox Windows DLLs are uh, .NET Standard 2.0 compliant, and we want to figure out is there some way that we can just 
bring these modules into PowerShell Core, have them become available to PowerShell Core without uh, any intervention from the user, um, or if it requires some intervention, you know, how do we minimize that? Uh, and how do we do that all without making the assembly load context and the, uh, you know, PS module path story really, really, really complicated? Uh, we've got Heyman here really trying. No, I'm just to... following up what I was doing. Oh, it was the path. Oh, somebody, somebody said this on the on the right. thread that I was doing it wrong. You guys know so much more about PowerShell than I do. <laughs> just doing his name. I'm just trying to see what. No, then not at all. And to show up on the DLL. What's that? Oh, you can import module on the DLL? Yeah, but no, it's going to complain about the PS snap. And... That's what it was doing. This is where the problem is. No, you have to do a file. Like, relative a dot slash. Yeah, that's where the snap is the problem. Yeah, so this is something we'd, we'd have to ask them to refactor, and it's not one that would probably ever work on Windows 7, 8, 1, 2008 or 2, 2012 or 2. This is something we'd have to fix in the future. But, you know, as part of this, we may also, and I don't want to make any promises here because this has been a, a difficult endeavor in the past, but, you know, we'd like to get a lot of these modules onto the gallery. Um, we'd like for these things to be able to be updated out of band and for you guys to be able to take, uh, you know, dependencies on the module and, and understand which versions those modules are compatible with, agnostic of which version Windows you're on. These are, you know. Right, and another thing is basically, uh, you guys reaching out to those teams are opening issues against their user voice or wherever uh, they al allow you to report things then us going to them when when we go to them they say yeah yeah you are powershell team you want everything in powershell but when customer goes out then like oh it's not the powershell team it's our customers who really want it kind of a thing so you'll so, see we still got this windows server i still monitor this uh on a semi-weekly basis somebody filed just the other day uh on us uh, some changes to the networking commandlets and this, this, you know, implement what if verbose and error action here, and I'm able to just move that over into their user voice forum. So, uh, you know, that's now on the on the DNS team uh, to look at. So they they should be monitoring this and and you know, dealing with their their issues in their area path. And you will see, in, based on the history, the 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 amount of things that can get done by customer support or customer. Uh, opening issues or making noise about it is way higher than what we can influence those teams directly because they, their priority is driven by customers and not by internal teams. Yeah, somebody said they didn't know that there was a Windows Server user voice. I'm okay. going to go ahead and paste so, that in the chat right now. So now you, you know there's Windows Server um, and on there there are different teams and different technologies you can ping them. Yep. Um, I also highly recommend using the Windows feedback tool for any commandlets that are not encapsulated in the sort of server uh, areas. Those are, are highly maintained and watched by the, the Windows 10 team. So um, definitely yeah, just tell them how to do that. Yeah, so that's the feedback hub. This is in Windows. Whoop. Feedback hub. There we go. Um, can't show this. <laughs> edit that out. Yeah, we may have to edit that out. So anyway, go into Feedback Hub. There's a section for PowerShell and, and commands and all that stuff. And, and right, I think we're losing this room. Yeah. We're, we're getting kicked out. We apologize, guys. Um, yep. Yeah, next meeting a few minutes before we start. We did text Twitter tweet out yesterday, but I will I will do it a few minutes before we start next time as well. Yeah, um, I have to rely on Joey to do that because a few minutes before I'm just trying to make it to the meeting. Thank you, Jeremiah. We appreciate it.